In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. our help is in the name of the Lord. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who should stand? Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together, as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ, and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. So call on our same servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue the intro in your bulletin. O oh Lord, I love the habitation of your house. Vindicate me, O oh Lord, for I have walked in my integrity. Prove me, O oh Lord, and try me. I wash my hands in innocence. I'll go around your altar, O Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. O Lord, I love the habitation of your house. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. To God on high be glory and peace to the earth. To God on God be glory to all the earth, good will from God on heaven, proclaim that Jesus birth. We praise and bless you, Father, your holy name we sing. Our thanks for your great glory, for God our heavenly King. To you, O soul, be God, and the Father, Son, we pray. O Lamb of God, our Savior, you take our sins away. Have mercy on us, Jesus, receive our heartfelt cry. Will you in power are seated? At God's right hand on high. For you alone are holy, you only are the Lord. Forever and forever, be worshiped and adored. You with the Holy Spirit alone are Lord most high. In God the Father's glory, Amen, our glad reply. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, defend your church from all false teaching and error, that your faithful people may confess you to be the only true God, and rejoice in your gifts of life and salvation through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. Our old 
Testament lesson for the 14th Sunday after Pentecost is Isaiah chapter 29. And to you the visions of all this would be like writing in a sealed scroll that men give to one who can read. Please read this, they say. I can't read it, he answered. It's sealed. And then they give the scroll to one who can't read. Please read it, they say. I can't read, he answers. The Lord says, These people come near me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And their way of worshiping me is with rules developed by men. And this is why I will again do something wonderful with these people, something wonderful and marvelous. The wisdom of their wise men will perish, and the intelligence of the intelligent men will vanish. Woe to those who keep their plans hidden deeply from the Lord. They do their work in the dark and say, Is there anyone who sees us or knows us? How wrong you are! Is a potter to be treated like his clay? Should what is made say about him who made it, he didn't make me? What is formed say of him who formed it, he doesn't understand? In just a little while, will not Lebanon turn into a garden land, and the garden land be considered a forest? On that day, the death will hear the words written in a book, and the blind coming out of their gloom and darkness will see. The humble will find new joy in the Lord, and the forest of the people will delight in the Holy One of Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Our epistle lessons from Ephesians chapter 5. You married women, obey your husbands as you obey the Lord, because a husband is the head of his wife, as Christ is the head of the church, which is his body that he saves. Yes, as the church obeys Christ, so wives should obey their husbands in everything. You husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, to make it holy by washing it clean with water by the word, and to have the church stand before him as something wonderful, without spot or a wrinkle or anything like that. Yes, it should be holy and without a fault. This is how husbands should love their wives like their own bodies. A man who loves his wife is loving himself. No one ever hated his own body. Everyone feeds it and treats it tenderly, as Christ does the church, because we are parts of his body. And this is why a man will leave his father and mother and live with his wife, and the two will be one flesh. There's a great truth hidden here. I mean that of Christ in the church. But every one of you too, Love your wife as you love yourself, and a wife should respect her husband. This is the word of the Lord. We rise. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the seventh chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The Pharisees and some Bible scholars who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus. They saw some of his disciples eat with unclean hands, that is, without washing them. Now the Pharisees, like all of the Jews, don't eat without washing their hands up to the wrist to keep the rules handed down by their fathers. Coming from the marketplace, they don't eat without first washing. And there are many other rules they've learned to keep. Baptizing cups, huge wine jars, and brass pans. Why don't your disciples live according to the rules handed down by our fathers? The Pharisees and Bible scholars were asking him. They eat with unclean hands. He told them, Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you hypocrites, as it is written. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain, because they teach men's rules. 
You give up God's commandment and keep men's rules, he added. You have a fine way of setting aside God's commandment in order to keep your rules. For example, Moses said, honor your father and your mother. Anyone who curses father or mother must die. But you say, if anyone says to his father or mother, anything by which I might help you is Corbin, that is a gift to God, then you don't let him do anything for his father or his mother anymore. In this way, by the rules you have taught, you set aside what God has said. And you've done many things like that. This is the gospel of the Lord. We confess our common faith found in the Apostles' Creed on page 207. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated for the hymn of the day. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today's message is based on our epistle lesson today. With all the horrible advice I see being spewed on the internet today concerning relationships and in particular marriage, 
I thought it'd be a good idea to address today's epistle lesson. Of course, it's not just on the internet. Most of you have watched TV since it was invented. <laughs> and you've seen the TV shows. And, and men are often, husbands are often painted as doofuses. And the wife has, wears the pants in the house. And uh, sometimes maybe the husband is some tyrant and the wife is just kind of, you know, hiding behind her skirt or whatever. And neither of these, of course, is what God intends for this holy institution and this relationship. There's not much good stuff out there on marriage. And I, I say marriage between a man and a woman. One man, one woman. <laughs> All right, so we have to say that because somebody might watch us on the internet. You know. In the setting of marriage of Ephesians, we have to back up a little bit to a few verses, like the verse 18, that which contains the main verb of this text, which is be filled with the Spirit and the fear of Christ. Everything that, that follows deals with being filled with the Holy Spirit and fearing Christ, putting your trust in Him. Apart from that, you, know, you just got pagan ideas floating about and the like. And having full of the Spirit and living in the fear of Christ, uh, there is the submitting to one another in verse 21. And after verse 21, we show how this submitting to one another plays its way out in three main relationships in marriage, in children, and work. And how one being called to willingly submit for the sake of Christ is the most valuable person, the person with the most honor. Subordination in biblical Christianity is not humiliating but as a humble act. It is not demeaning, but gives the person honor. This is unlike how the world thinks, where if you submit yourself to another, you're, you're, you're humiliating yourself and you're demeaning yourself. Well, that's not the case at all in the Christian faith. And so, we have Paul writing first to wives. Wives, obey your husband as you obey the Lord. Isn't that important? As you obey the Lord is very important there because it is placing the husband there in the place of Christ. He's not just any old man. It's not every man. It's your husband. And he's there, stands aside. This is I as a pastor stand in the place of Christ in the household, the husband stands in the place of Christ. And he should be obeyed for that. Husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the church. We don't run around doing whatever we want as the church. We listen to Christ. What does he say? What does he command? What does he forbid? What does he promise? What does he do for us? What are we not going to receive from him if we're running around disobeying him and running and doing whatever we want, saying, don't tell me what to do. I'm my own person. Not if you're in Christ. You belong to Christ now. The church is Christ's body. And we have to understand that. It is his bride. He is the bridegroom. He saves his church. And that means you. You are all part of the bride of Christ. And we all have to look to Christ as our head. But in the marriage relationship, the wife looks to the husband. For he saves it. When the wife obeys her husband as unto the Lord, it is an act of worship. It's an act of worship. It's part of your daily worship as a wife. Now, some will go, well, 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 well. What, if, what if he's a jerk? <laughs> so what? <laughs> Obey your husbands in everything. 
notwithstanding sinful desires, just as much as we are called to obey the government and whatever it commands us. But if it commands us to do something apart from God's will, we have to gently say, uh, no thanks. I'm not going to do that. That's in opposition to what God wants. But why wouldn't you obey your husbands in everything? What are you afraid he's going to tell you to do? Why would you marry someone that you do not trust in all things? Isn't it right? Why would you marry this person if you don't trust them? Of course, once you are married, it's too late. <laughs> now you're married. Obey him in everything he tells you to do. This is your worship as a Christian wife. You are pleasing God when you do so. Now, wives, you get off easy. Husbands, Paul says, love your wives as Christ loved the church. You know, in the ancient world, the ancient world had no standard for a husband to love the wife. In most cultures, the wives were just considered chattel. They belonged to the husband, do whatever he wanted with. Not so with a Christian husband. You are to love your wife as Christ loves the church. Christ gave himself, sacrificed himself for the church. Therefore, husbands are to give themselves, sacrifice themselves, sacrifice their desires, their whims, their interests on behalf of their wives. They are to always be thinking about their wives and how they can put their wife first and how they may please their wives. Next to Christ, the wife is the most precious and valuable person to the husband. Or at least she ought to be. Just as the church is the most precious and valuable thing to Christ Jesus. You, you are the most precious and valuable thing to Christ Jesus. He gave up his life for you. And similarly, husbands, you do the same thing. The giving of Christ to the church is the husband's model to follow. And when Christ sacrificed himself unto the church, it says he made it holy and clean and the washing of the water and the word. What a wonderful thing here that Christ has done this for us to end baptism. You can just hear Luther's small catechism. What is baptism? Baptism is not water only, but it is water combined with the word, right? It makes a precious washing and regeneration. Right? And so he, that's what Christ has done for us. That's what he's done for you in holy baptism. He's made you clean, made you holy. For once you were unclean and unholy, you once belonged to the devil himself. Now you belong to Jesus. The church, like the wife, stands before Christ wonderful, without spot or wrinkle. It is holy and without fault. And each one of us individually are that as well. Now Paul said it earlier in Ephesians chapter 1. He's going to bring us to this spot. He's going to present us to God the Father this way. Jude, in his verse 21, says the same thing. He's going to present all of us to a heavenly father, holy, blameless, without spot, wrinkle, stain. And husbands, in similar fashion, should look at their wives as such. I was watching a little clip this morning, and uh, at this morning she's going, you know, asking her husband, you know, who's, you know, she's like, I know I'm not the most beautiful person in the world, she told him. And he goes, what are you talking about? You are the most beautiful woman in the world to me. Not just your outward beauty, but everything else about you. Your wife, mother, friend, all these other characteristics that made her the most beautiful woman in the world to him. Our wives should always be the most beautiful woman in the world to us. Not just outward beauty, but their heart, their spirit. As the psalmist or as Proverbs, Solomon, one of the other guys wrote there in Proverbs 31, an excellent wife who can find, and that should indeed should always be our wives. 
Just as Christ sacrificed himself for the church in similar fashion, husbands sacrificed themselves for the sake of their wives and look upon them in similar fashion as Christ does his church. Paul tells husbands to love your wives as their own bodies because it is his own body. The husband and wife are one flesh. We saw that all the way back in Genesis chapter 2. God made the woman, took him from the woman. From Adam's side, the bone. What's my now? Bone of, bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. Is there one flesh? Christ, Jesus himself, he also emphasizes this in the Gospels and tells us again that husbands and wives are one flesh. Therefore, nothing should ever separate them. And Paul here also confirms this for us. How we treat our wives is how we treat ourselves. It is our own body. No one hates their own body, not generally, unless you're kind of, you, know, you might be a sick person or something like that. Kind of loose, screw loose up here. But normally you treat your body well. And you should treat your wife as well. Tenderly, feeding her, loving her, as Christ treats his body, the church, as he feeds us now his word as he feeds us with the word over there as he feeds us with the words of absolution as he feeds us with his body and blood so too husbands should take care of their wives it's a great mystery Paul says this is why a man will leave his father and mother and live with his wife and the two will become one flesh it's a great truth hidden here he says I mean that of Christ in the church but every one of you too love your wife as you love yourself, and a wife should respect her husband. Christ and the church are one body. Right? Wherever two or three of us are gathered, there he is in the midst of us. If you're reading the daily uh, lectionary that's printed in your bulletin, right? you're going through 1 Corinthians, and Paul keeps talking about there, about though we are many members, we are all individually members of that one body each one of us necessary you and I are all members of Christ's body in one spirit with him and Christ cleaves to his church he promises I will never leave you or forsake you I am with you always even to the ends of the age and since this is true Paul says husbands love your wives as yourselves this is our standard man Wives show fear and respect for your husband. We're called to do that. So you don't go and complain or public about your husband or you don't go and you know, tear him down in front of other people. Talk to him. Show him fear and respect. The husband also publicly should be looking around at other women. He should be always have his attitude and his focus should be on his wife. And in this, Husband loves their wives as they love themselves, as wives show fear and respect to their husbands, both husbands and wife be blessed as the church is by Christ. Amen. May the peace of God so beyond all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature, let us pray to the Lord. For this congregation, its mission, and its people, for the ability to meet the needs that arise as we do the work God has given us to do, 
and for the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Let us pray to the Lord. For the educational institutions of our synod, for our preschools, our day schools, and high schools, our colleges and universities, and for our seminaries, that those who teach and those who learn of them will be transformed by the wisdom of Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. For all who partake this day of Christ's holy body and blood, that in their eating and drinking, they may receive the benefits of forgiveness of sins and renewal of life, and have a foretaste of the feast to come, let us pray to the Lord. For those who have wandered from the faith that the Holy Spirit would use us to call them home to the Father, let us pray to the Lord. For the government and all who have been set in positions of leadership, that they may use the authority entrusted to them honorably and for the good of all people, let us pray to the Lord. For all who serve in worthy occupations, professions, arts, and sciences, that God would grant them skill and integrity in the performance of their responsibilities and valued service of their vocations, let us pray to the Lord. For those who suffer from hunger, homelessness, poverty, or unemployment, that God's great mercy and love would preserve and relieve them, let us pray to the Lord. For all the faithful, that the Spirit would lead them to cheerful, generous giving from the bounty the Lord provides to support the church and help those in need, let us pray to the Lord. For those who are sick, chronically ill, or undergoing other trials and tribulations in their lives, for Steve, Donna, and Emma, Ron, Stella, and Kinsley, and Dina, Tree, Kelly, and Jane, Kathy, Donovan, and Dylan, for Ashley, Jean, Chris, Karen, Jennifer, John, Charles, Barbara, Gerald, Abby, and Trevor, Marta, Debbie, Vaughn, myself, Mary, Jeff, Gerald, uh, Irene, Betty, Doris, Cody, Jackie, Ken, and Sandra, Dorothy, Joanne, and Jean, that God would grant healing to the body, strength to bear their infirmities, and grant them patience and endurance until they're delivered from their trials and tribulations. Let us pray to the Lord. We pray, the Lord, for all those who are traveling this week. We pray, Lord, your holy angels of guard and keep them safe and may their travels be uneventful. Let us pray to the Lord. For those who rejoice in the rich blessings of God, that they may always remember the giver of every gift and give them heartfelt thanks. Let us pray to the Lord. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. For to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We continue on page 208. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Father, Almighty, Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you shall freely bestow on us in all creation. Above all, we give thanks for the boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh, and laid on him our sin, giving him into death, that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Sabaoth adored, heaven and earth with full acclaim, shout the glory of your name. 
sing Hosanna in the highest, sing Hosanna to the Lord. Truly blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, and whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. And when he would given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is a New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Take and eat the true body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the true blood of Christ shed for you for the remission of your sins. May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, keep, strengthen, and preserve you in the one true faith and the life everlasting. Go in peace.
Let us pray. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come and the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us firm in a true faith throughout our days of pilgrimage, that on the day of his coming, we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Let us bless the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord of his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. You may be seated for the closing hymn. Okay, well, good morning again.